Conversation with a Geographer. I'm Mike DeVivo, Professor of Geography at Grand Rapids Community College. And today we are very fortunate to have Daniela Marini, Assistant Professor at, of Integrative Studies, although a geographer, at Grand Valley State University. Daniela, thank you so much for showing up today and, and being part of this chapter in the history of geography. Thank you so much for inviting me, Mike. It's it's a pleasure to, uh, you, to you, share you, what I have to share. <laughs> well, you're very welcome. As we begin all of these interviews, I ask I ask people to think about um, your past, then think about perhaps your childhood. What what might have inspired you to pursue geography growing up or or, or, or later in school and your studies, would you care to comment? Yeah, of course. So I guess when I was five years old, mm -hmm. my parents moved from Buenos Aires, the capital city in Argentina, mm -hmm. to the countryside, eight hours away from the mm -hmm. big city. And so I think from a very early age, I have this understanding of the diversity of landscapes and mm -hmm. ways in which people live and ways in which, yeah, people, um, make a living in different places so that and also traveling my parents were big travelers and took us my siblings and i traveling every summer and so after we moved to the countryside um so my dad would sell tractors and harvesting machines mm -hmm. and every summer we would travel around getting to know the country outside of buenos aires and for five consecutive summers, we went to Patagonia, to the Atlantic coast, and camp on the beach mm -hmm. and eat from the ocean. We would fish. My sister and I were in charge of keeping track of the tide. So we were um, harvesting, collecting mussels. Mm -hmm. So when the tide was very low, we would go and get the mussels. My mom would get algaes and make uh, omelets with the algaes. And my dad and brother were the ones fishing and getting snails, diving. Mm -hmm. So that really makes me love the ocean. Together with my dad getting uh, Jacques Cousteau videos and Jacques Cousteau exploring mm -hmm. oceans and cultures from all over the world. And people eating fish and relating to the ocean in different ways. So to me, was that traveling, connecting to the ocean and understanding different ways in which you can uh, experience your surroundings and eat your surroundings and uh, yeah, be in different places. And then so that really set me up to wanting to study marine biology as mm -hmm. many young people wanted and still want to do. But my hometown, it's far, far away from the ocean. So my parents were, why don't you just study biology and then you move to the coast and do the marine part. Mm -hmm. was, okay, cool. And there was a big program, a public university. And so I did my undergrad. Undergrad in Argentina is, is different from here. It's a licenciatura, it's six years focused on one discipline. Mm -hmm. And so I, I started biology, plant biology, plant ecology. So let me get this straight. Yeah. You pursue one particular discipline, quite unlike mm -hmm. the students that you have today right. who are dabbling in another a number of disciplines and trying to decide what they want to choose yes. to study and changing their minds somewhere. Yeah, so it was very hard. At 18, when I finished high school, I was, okay, one thing, I knew, I knew I wanted to do biology, mm -hmm. marine biology, but it was gonna be biology in general. But I remember last year of high school, we had these uh, sessions with professors talking through what are desires and plans, because it's a big decision. You commit for five, six years to one discipline, very different from the US. Mm -hmm. So to me, later on, coming to the US allowed me to expand that. So I started with a very sure. narrow focus, and that what led me to geography at the end, because in a way I was trying to escape from that very narrow disciplinary focus of biology. Was it largely taxonomic? based or was it ecologically based out? all of it we okay. had six years of looking at plants so taxonomy physiology botany morphology mm -hmm. all of it but this idea that humans were separated somehow from the ecological system so i did my my thesis project on forest restoration mm -hmm. in places invaded by soul cedar uh, th this region where I, I grew up and I did my studies is, uh, it's the Pampas, is the mm -hmm. west, western side of the Pampas. 
And so now it's mostly soybean fields, corn fields, very much like Midwest US in a way. And so forests are these uh, historical ecosystems. And on top of that, we were looking at these invasive species, salt cedar, which is very common in the US, in the Southwest US. All the papers I read for my thesis were from the Southwest US. And we were applying the ecology of salt cedar and very little research on how to restore forest invaded by these species in uh, Cordoba which is mm -hmm. the province where I, I did my project. And so after two years of learning, my, my, the goal was to develop protocols on how to propagate uh, native species, transplant them and monitor the growth and diversity. So we have our experimental plots, we treated salt cedar. And so we were monitoring the ecology of the place for two years and it was doing great. We transplanted seed banks from native forests, uh, shrubs and trees to restore the whole thing. And after two years, the owner of the land who gave us permission to do the, the experiment, he told me, if you get down all the salt cedars, salt cedars, I won't have grass to feed my cows during the winter. I was, oh my God, we never asked the owner of the land who is using this land if he had any use for these plants. We were coming with this, mm -hmm. no, invasive species are bad. We need to get rid of them. And so I went to talk to my advisors and I was, there's something wrong here. And their answer was, he doesn't know about the impact of invasive species. And I, that wanted me to pursue, to expand my understanding of this social environmental dynamic in which we were approaching it from a very disciplinary biology focus. People were not part of it. And so that really set me up on a journey of looking for what's my next, um, theoretical field, intellectual uh, interest that would ha give me the tools and answers I needed to make sense of that. So this particular revelation mm -hmm. was a catalyst for you yep. seeking to examine the relationship between people exactly. and the environment. And actually that story was part of my uh, application letter for the School of Forestry at Yale. Mm -hmm. And so I was admitted. I got a full One of the scholarship. Top forestry programs in the world. And I yes. didn't know that. Mm -hmm. I just knew this program because I met a student, master student, doing his thesis in Argentina, and that's why I knew about this program. Uh, but before that, before I finished biology, every summer during those six years, I would travel to Patagonia to work as a volunteer in different national parks to do all kinds of random things for two months in these beautiful places. And one summer I was there uh, at the uh, visitor center and this group of researchers from Argentina and Boulder, CU Boulder, Colorado came. That was their study site in El Chalten, uh, Glaciers National Park. Mm -hmm. You know, the Patagonia logo. So we were there and they were looking for a field assistant to core trees to do they were looking at the impact of this Lepidoptera, a kind of butterfly, who was eating the forest. Every six, seven years, there were these massive defoliations, but with uh, increasing temperatures, they were doing it more frequently. So they were monitoring that. So we were covering the trees to see, you could tell in the tree rings when these events happened. And, and at so, Yale, there had been quite a bit of research done on something similar with regard to gypsy moths for many Oh, yeah, years. yeah. Uh-huh. They, they were applying methods developed mm -hmm. for that kind of research. Yes. And one day, the advisor of this Argentine PhD student in CU Boulder came to supervise the project, and he's Thomas Bevelin, who's a physical geographer mm -hmm. and forest ecologist. And I met him, and I remember having these conversations about plants and I, I would tell him how I would see plants in the mountains in Cordoba, similar to plants, the same, same species or genus in Patagonia. So we talk a lot about biogeography mm -hmm. and plant ecology and forest ecology. And so we, we connected there. And so well, after I finished biology and I wanted to find other platforms for my uh, thinking and engaging with the world, I, uh, a professor told me you should go to Costa Rica to do this summer course on ecology in the tropics. I was, I want to go there. So I reached out to Tom to write me a recommendation letter. I went there and then, yeah, I met, I met an anthropologist 
uh, from uh, CU Santa Cruz doing work with uh, rice farmers and ducks. And there, there was a whole conflict between uh, these ducks are protected by Ducks Unlimited in the US, so rice farmers could not kill the ducks. Mm -hmm. So they had to stay up all night scaring the ducks away. There was a, a, another social environmental dynamic that I was very interested in. And so he trained me in ethnographic methods and I stayed working for him in Costa Rica. At the same time, I was applying for a PhD in Argentina, in Ushuaia. I got that and this is 2009. That was a crucial year for me. So I was finishing bio I finished biology looking for a PhD program in Argentina. Then I met this anthropologist who really encouraged me to apply for a program in the US. And the only program I knew was this School of Forestry. And I was, okay, I'm gonna apply. I remember going to an open house. So he invited me to come to the US to write together after all the data I collected. And that's how I came to the US for the first time. And that was super fun. I went to the open house. I remember being there, learning about the budget. I was, oh my God, I will never be able to pay that. In Argentina, I the universities are free and open and public. And that's something we value a lot. And now we're struggling a lot to keep that way. And I was, oh no, I'm, I will never be able to pay that. So a great experience, but I'm going back to do my PhD in Argentina. And he really encouraged me to take, to, just apply, take the GRE, do the TOEFL exam. I was okay. I just did it for the experience. And I remember as I was looking for tickets to fly to Ushuaia to start my PhD, I got an email from Gail saying, you got a full scholarship. So it was a very easy decision for me. <laughs> the, the PhD program that I, uh, I was going to do was to develop pro protocol to cultivate this one species of plant to which is used for chemotherapy mm -hmm. but it was all set up for me there was no thinking much thinking involved other than technical and lab experiments but not the kind of thinking i was thirsty for and then when i got this scholarship i was okay i'm going and so i spent two years in new haven doing my masters and my final project was uh i connected with tom beblin again mm -hmm. And so I was looking at forest fires in Patagonia, part of his project. Sure. So they were looking at all the physical variables. And he asked me if I wanted to do the human social aspects of fire, the, the political ecology side. Sure. So my master's was to me learning and getting immersed for the first time into political ecology, different from the political, apolitical ecology I was doing before. That was like, yes, this is it. And so we did this project together, but the kind of data I was able to gather that summer of field work were kind of uh, people burning the forest because they were protesting against uh, park agents in closing their lands because mm -hmm. they wanted to kick them out or yeah, setting fires. So fires would escape <clears throat> from national parks to a provincial territory and that would create news and they will be in the news. So that kind of uh, social aspects of fire were very hard to compute together with all the physical variables. And so again, I saw this disconnect between the kind of research I was doing and how can we integrate these real social dynamics that exist on the ground and these more uh, physical abstract at a different scales uh, data on forest fires, temperatures, currents. So the project ended, but we, would, we were not able to really bring the perspectives together. And with that in mind, Tom Bevelin told me, why don't you apply for a PhD at CU Boulder? And so that's what I did. <laughs> <laughs> but then he saw me uh, very into political ecology, more radical than the kind of data I needed to produce to produce social qualitative data compatible with these sorts of equations. So he suggested me to work with the political ecology people. Joe Bryan, he, he was my advisor and still he's a very great support. Emily Ye, mm -hmm. who's another wonderful, very influential person in my, in my thinking, and Jennifer Fleury. Mm -hmm. uh, so these 
three people, they really were a wonderful platform for me to explore these questions I had about when I started my PhD, it was all about why there is this division between physical and human geography, this nature-culture divide that I was all the time trying to make sense. They work together. Why mm -hmm. we insist on separating them? Well, you had an all-star team, I suppose, that really helped you cultivate that integration. Yes, yes. I remember at the beginning, I still had these two things. I was trained as a biologist, so to me, I wanted to, for instance, take, um, collect samples of soil and produce quantitative data and connect that with interview data. And Emily pushed me to think further. Why do you have these two things together? How I was still thinking, I was not making the, the mm -hmm. connection yet. So she really- You were compartmentalizing things. Right. Mm -hmm. I was still thinking as a biologist with those methods and techniques. And then after my second, third year, when I started doing preliminary research back in Argentina, I switched topics. I was, okay, agriculture. Agriculture, monocultivation of soybeans is the big driver of deforestation and environmental degradation. What are people proposing to stop this? What are the alternative ways in which people are trying to put forward to produce food in a way that is not that devastating. So that led me into looking at agroecology and food sovereignty. So that became my focus for my political ecology thinking. Agroecology, food sovereignty, what are these efforts? What are people doing? How does it look in practice and how does what what are the discursive and material practices of agroecology? So first year of uh, preliminary field work in Argentina, I got engaged with a uh, an organization called uh, Rio Cuarto, which is the name of my hometown, without mm -hmm. agrotoxins. And they were developing a municipal ordinance to stop the spread of pesticides surrounding the city. And so I participated in the meetings where we were drawing, writing uh, a draft ordinance on how to do that. And I was very invested in that. I truly believe in that this is a way in which we can change the way things are done. So the idea was to uh, reduce the use of uh, contaminants surrounding the city to create spaces for agroecological production. And so that's when my PhD dissertation started to take shape. Until one summer I went back, uh, I asked my partners there, let's go to see these places. This, where we were drawing maps without having gone to the field. So Had you looked at other examples of communities elsewhere in the world that were really attempting to do the same thing as in, for example, in Oaxaca or mm. Chiapas. We were looking at other examples within Argentina. Mm -hmm. This was not the first case. We were, yeah, bringing experiences from many cities in the Pampas affected by this massive expansion. Since 1994, soybean mm -hmm. exploded. So within Cordoba, we were looking at other three municipalities working on this. So yeah, it was copying the model and uh, trying to adapt it to our city. And so one day we went to explore these lands and this is when I saw for the first time farms worked by Bolivian migrants who were the ones producing the vegetables that we were consuming in the city. So there were these um, family farms, people living and working in the outskirts uh, who would produce tons of lettuce, all the greens that then they would transport to the central market and then grocers would buy the produce there. So we, we would see them. They were not part of our visible landscape, but the food we were eating was coming from there. And of course, as they are part of these very um, Mar market that is very competitive, they, they were using a lot of chemicals. They were producing greenhouses to extract more per area of land. So they were practicing toxic agriculture that from the perspective of this group, that was against their mission and vision. And so that created a whole questioning in my part, not for the others. So it was, we cannot let this ordinance to work against the people who are producing the food. 
And the answer I will go was, this is not a problem. We don't want chemicals here. We are fighting against all kinds of agrotoxins. And that changed my research questions again. That led me delve into issues of race and ethnicity in Argentina and how ideas of race play out through environmental thinking. What's the correct way of producing food, of doing agriculture? Who is the uh, appropriate environmental subject? The Bolivians were not because they were using agrochemicals, but there was a whole intricate set of relations that made them use agrochemicals. But that was a very complicated issue for this activist group to get into, which was at the bottom of exploitation and, uh, yeah, very exploitative labor systems. And so that became my dissertation project. How this map that these well-intentioned activists were creating on how to reduce toxicity was knowingly excluding the people producing food that we were eating. And so I spent a whole year hanging out at the farms, Bolivian farms, learning about their challenges, their perspectives, the, their connections to Bolivia, why they were there, um, and the, their perspective of their role in the city. And that was a totally new understanding of the food system in my hometown. And this, again, this repeated in many other places in Argentina. It's very similar to Mexican um, farmers in the US, mm -hmm. in which they are out there picking apples and blueberries, but we don't see them. So, but I got the exposed aware of that. to toxins, uh, and 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 they're in the the margins, but their role is imperative so that we can enjoy low food prices. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, and that was it. These the agriculture proposal was promoting this double standard in food production, similar to uh, what happened in California with the origins of the agriculture movement, mm -hmm. organic food for those who can pay it and food as business as usual for most people. And so at the beginning, talking against agroecology, I call it mainstream agroecology, was hard because people are all about agroecology. We need to stop the use of chemicals. But I was always bringing the conversation to they are the first affected by the use of agrochemicals and they know it. But they have no choice. They are the ones producing the food under these exploitative conditions. The only way in which we can transform the food system is by working with them and their uh, needs and challenges. Otherwise, we are reproducing exclusions, the exclusions that agriculture is trying to work against. And so then I delve deeply into the world of Bolivian farmers, horticulturalists, and they have their own agriculture project, but that's mainly in Buenos Aires. Bolivians have their uh, popular agriculture project in which they, the, their first demand is access to the land. Um, so they develop this whole um, system in which instead of their rent, they're paying will turn out in uh, buying, acquiring the land they're working. There is a lot, they, they need to move a lot as rental prices increase. So access to the land was their first demand. And at the end, and in geography in general, in human geography, we get to that point. Who owns the land? Who has access to that? So the, the mainstream agroecology project was not questioning that. It was this uh, wealthy or wealthier, uh, middle class, young, white people who had access to land probably, wanting to do agriculture in their lands. But the questioning was not beyond that. And so now I'm, I'm in the process of wor working on my book manuscript that is tentatively called Agroecology from Below, in which I engage with these different visions. I, I'm trying to contrast this mainstream understanding of agroecology well-intentioned, wanting to stop the terrible cases of toxicity and all the illnesses that the soybean model brings to Argentina and Brazil and many other countries, and this vision of uh, popular agroecology. What does it mean? How are these different? And 
what can we learn from each other? So after I finished my PhD three years ago, and so now I'm going back to all my data and all the drafts and chapters and ideas, trying to make sense of chapters for my book, which is very exciting and intimidating. <laughs> well, it should be exciting. It's, um, it's something though that you obviously have a passion to mm -hmm. engage in that kind of research and um, it's challenging for sure. And uh, um, it's not simple. It's a very complicated task and mm -hmm. good geographers engage in the hard work to conquer many of those complications. And it is hard. Hard things are hard. <laughs> yep. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a wonderful story. I, I, um, I, I could talk about this for hours with you. I do have a couple of questions though, if you don't mind. Yeah. W would you care to comment on some more parallels between what you saw in Argentina mm -hmm. with regard to this particular agroecological, I'll call it a crisis of sorts. Mm -hmm. And would you say that that's a fair statement, an agroecological crisis or at least conflict and, and in the US? Yes, I think it's tied to ideas of who we are as belonging to a country nationalist ideas of what agriculture is mm -hmm. and Julie Gutman was very influential in my thinking and viewing of this problem uh, where she develops the whole history history of how agriculture started in in California and yeah it starts like a the ideal the the vision and the mission of agriculture is to promote environmental justice, to undo systems of oppression that are transforming food systems in a way that are detrimental for most people. But then there is this separation between those who are even able to get there to question and those who are still out in the field doing the work. And I think that, that there is a parallel there. People thinking at the university, reproducing agroecological farms, and then stopping to engage with the, the lie of the land. Those mm -hmm. who are, don't have time to stop. And people would tell me when I would interview them and go into their farms, if they would tell me if I would have time to stop production and let the soil rest, I would do it. And I know it would be great, but I can't, I need to deliver my crates tomorrow and tonight and I cannot stop. So they know, it's not that they don't know. There are all, all these intricacies of the system that made them do that. And so it really requires going into the dark parts of the system. In this case was the centralizing markets mm -hmm. that were profiting from keeping farmers out of the view and having a lot of intermediaries profiting from their products. And so, yeah, we need to get into legislation. We need to start talking about race and racism in, in Argentina, where people say that that doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. We're all white people, or we all came from Europe in the ships, all descendants from Italia. But no, and many of the families that I call Bolivians, they're actually uh, second and third generation of Argentine Bolivians. They are Argentines, but we still call them Bolivians. We don't accept them as part mm -hmm. of our nation. So uh, going back to your question, I think there is a lot of agriculture and nationalism and environmental protection and nationalism. And so my, my dissertation ended up with this very complicated name or big words name, race, nature and nation in Argentina's soy toxic fields. So these words, nature, nation, and nation, the, the complicated ways in which they play out together, abstractly and in practice. So untangling that, it's, it's something you can do as a geographer. Sure. <laughs> well, again, again, our, our field, um, 
really facilitates one to engage in eclectic study. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We can we can include and integrate so many different phenomena mm -hmm. across the natural and the social sciences. And I guess, as I think about this, you're in integrative studies, mm -hmm. which had been interdisciplinary studies, I think, for some time, but yes. it's integrative studies now. And um, you have students that really, I assume, seek diversity in their mm -hmm. studies. And it would seem to me that what you've related to me would be very appealing mm -hmm. to students in your classes. Have you shared this with students in your classes? Yes, I'm fortunate enough to teach a class called Food Matters. Mm -hmm. Food Matters. Yes, and we are working with a book called Food and Place by geographers. And it's fascinating because we can approach food and agriculture from very different scales, and then we bring them together. And it lends very well to really understand how, what geography does. So we start looking at global commodity chains. I ask my students to pick a, an agricultural product produced outside of the US mm -hmm. and trace all the steps until a store in Michigan. And so we start with this global perspective of where food is sourced. And then we move into the landscape scale. We look at urban foodscapes we look at uh, gentrification processes through food, new restaurants coming into town to beautify the city and attract young, uh, wealthier people. Uh, we look at community gardens, urban gardens, and all these practices that involve people and plants working together at the urban scale. And then we end the class looking at homes and home kitchens and gender dynamics in the kitchen. And then students are able to connect what happened in the intimate space of a domestic kitchen with the global commodity chains that brought the coffee into that kitchen. So yeah, and something I try to bring to all my classes is this, um, that, the, the, the interconnectedness of places. And especially teaching in the US, my mission is to broaden students' understanding of the world outside of the U.S. and mm -hmm. the impact of the U.S. in uh, mostly in Latin America. And so again, looking at food and agriculture, I remember when we started the class, this student, we were looking at global commodity chains. He was looking at bananas from uh, Guatemala. And he said, he shared in class that we are helping people in Guatemala by buying their bananas. And so we had to do a lot of work to understand the history behind it and mm -hmm. why some countries are producing uh, raw materials without added value. And that's why we're buying very cheap bananas in the US. So is the question really benefiting it, them or who's paying the cost of the social and environmental externalities that made you pay some sense for the bananas you eat? So. When I get those answers, I understand that students don't really get or haven't gotten yet the idea that the interdependencies that were created using food and agricultural products as a political weapon to create the, the current geopolitical landscape. Sure. And so again, food allows me to make all these connections. So it's a, it's a very fun class to teach. I can imagine, and, <laughs> and students, do students realize at the end of the class, how spoiled we are mm -hmm. here in this country, in this area where you know, we can go to a grocery store and get anything we want. And Out if of we, season. And if we don't want to do as much as cut an avocado or, or bake potatoes, we can go ahead to the frozen section mm -hmm. and just stick something in the microwave. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, now I'm looking at comments from my students, which is exciting. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's kind of scary, <laughs> <laughs> but they mostly share that the class expanded, expanded their understanding of connectedness between places and how they, they were not thinking beyond the blueberries from Chile now they're sure. coming. And now they look at the package and they 
have some more thought about that little fruit in the box. Mm -hmm. There's more to it than just the visible box. You know, it's it's interesting that you're able to teach such a class mm -hmm. really at a regional public university as a geography professor, as a junior faculty member. Mm -hmm. That is something that is a, a it, it, it's developing for you a very rich experience that that many of your colleagues who are going into geography programs may not be able to practice as they are tasked with teaching general education courses mm -hmm. that directly transfer to somewhere or our traditional courses that follow textbook chapters. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, yeah. So something I was advised to do when I finished mm -hmm. up my PhD was to brand myself within a recognizable field. Mm -hmm. So that was, uh, I became a food scholar. And so when I applied for this job at Grand Valley, I was hired to teach this class because I got this great advice of, yeah, selling myself. This is what I do. And this is an approachable, approachable way of communicating what I do. And then as I talked about before, it's food and agriculture and geopolitics and a lot, sure. but food captures and communicates. Indeed. In a way that it's approachable. And so that, that was a great advice I got from. Well, that's, um, that, that's wonderful advice. And speaking of advice, we have about a minute to go here. I'm going to ask you to reflect upon the path that you've trod and to consider any advice that you might be able to give students who might be prospective geography majors and also maybe graduate students who are pursuing field work or dissertation research. Do you have some pearls of wisdom you'd like to share? <laughs> well, I would say, first of all, that I think they made the right decision to pursue geography, <laughs> to give shape to their desires and dreams, because the discipline, as you mentioned earlier, is very eclectic and mm -hmm. it really allows, you, allows us to do a lot within and outside academia. And so, yeah, I think it's a matter of uh, connecting the dots of our interests and uh, being able to communicate that in a way that people understand what we are doing and yeah pursuing your dreams because you can do that you can really you have the flexibility of uh borrowing tools and uh concepts and uh different ways of approaching reality that can be very impactful and rewarding even in, in a personal level on a professional level you can do a lot with it and it's hard at times it's very hard writing is very hard but there are people there's always people who are there to support us and you and me are here because we got a lot of support and if you reach out to people who have similar interests or regional interests you're it's probably that you're gonna get a good response and people will wanna would will want to help you because we were helped. And yeah, I guess my advice is just keep going and do what you desire to do. Like pursue your dreams within geography and outside geography, but geography is very good at that. It, it helps. <laughs> Absolutely. I think it's, it's very important as well. I encourage my students to pursue their dreams. And yes, geography in, many ways is an answer to them, mm -hmm. you know. Daniela, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been a wonderful talk. I really appreciate you taking the time to come to the studio and, and um, make a contribution to the history of geography. Thank you so much, Mike. <laughs> it's, All right. it's been well, fun. <laughs> well, this now concludes this episode of Conversation with a Geographer. Thank you.